And let me see, starting up. Let's see if it's working. Those unused applications, they are closed. And it looks a little slow. I don't know. Oh, it came up. It says it came up on my phone. Anyway, I'm not going to belabor the point. If it comes up, if it comes, if it does, if it doesn't, it don't. But we're going to get started momentarily. And uh, though we had that riveting prayer, we're just going to pray for one moment uh, concerning this Bible study. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you thanking and praising you for this opportunity and for this moment and for your people that are here at this time. We ask you now that you just open up the eyes of our understanding that we may ingest your word, digest it, and be strengthened by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are just so grateful this evening to be here. And I'm just, I'm still waiting for our video to start for um, Facebook Live. It doesn't seem like it's starting. So I'm not going to even worry about that because I got y'all. And so I got a captive audience, as they say. Uh, so that's the good thing. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on with it today. We are going to start with, I want to start with uh, here in, in, and I want you, if those of you have your Bible, I have two different scriptures. The first is 1 Peter 5, 7 through 9. 1 Peter 5, 7 through 9. And uh, I'm going to read it. And I'm going to mute all y'all right now. Hear some background. So I can hear, I mean, you can hear me. I won't be able to hear you, unfortunately. And I'll bring you back in a little while. Let me see here. All participants are muted and they can unmute themselves. Okay. So here we are. This is 1 Peter 5, 7 through 9. And it says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. And that's 1 Peter 5, 7 through 9. Then I have another scripture and it says here, to the pure, oh, excuse me, this is Titus, I'm sorry, Titus 1.15. Just that one verse in Titus, Titus 1.15. And it says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. And that again is Timothy 1.15. And so tonight, I just want to talk about from the subject of don't go for the okie doke. And that is our subject tonight. Don't go for the okie doke. Um, some of us, I guess, old heads, we know uh, what that term means. Uh, don't go for the trick. Don't fall for uh, the trap. Don't, don't allow yourself to get caught up in it. And so tonight, just for a few moments, we wanted to really talk about that. Um, as always, I'm going to try to stick to my notes as best I can. And, um, and I'm still checking here. I do not know why this video is not started. Um, I got to see if someone, um, uh, if it started for anyone. It didn't start for me here. So I'm guess it didn't start for anybody. I should start it all over. But anyway, I'm not going to, I'm not going to belabor the point. Here we go. You ready? Um, so I'm going to start with my notes and I want y'all to, I want y'all to really, that's why I love having the people on the phone so I can bring you back in. Cause I want you to really, really hear, uh, uh, what the Lord is saying to us and give me some feedback and let me know exactly just what's going on. Um, and I'll read it here. It says, in the art of war, one of the most dangerous things you could do is lose track of the whereabouts of your enemy. Uh -huh. In matter of fact, experienced soldiers will not know where the, in excuse me, experienced soldiers will know where the enemy is at all times how the enemy fights, and what weapons the enemy has at their disposal. And matter of fact, that's so important. I want to read that one more time so we're on the same page. In the art of war, 
one of the most dangerous things you can do is to lose track of the whereabouts of your enemy. A matter of fact, experienced soldiers will know where the enemy is at all times, how the enemy fights, and what weapons the enemy has at their disposal. Can you say amen to the reading of God's word and for what he's given us? That's a quote I found that I am so, so grateful for. And what that says to me is that and, and I liken a lot of things to sports or different things that you can't afford to lose track of the enemy. You cannot afford to, if you're in a battle, or let's say you're in a football game and you're, and, and, and you're on the field, you've got to know where everybody is at all times because if you not to look at them and not to know that could cause you a lot of hurt and pain if you're, if you're looking to the left and they come from the right or vice versa. And you've got to know where the enemy is. You've got to be study them. Uh, um, professional sports, they study films on people, their tendencies and, and the things that they do. And we've got to do the same thing. We've got to understand that in the warfare against our enemy, and that's nobody but the devil, we have to really, really study him. We have to know his whereabouts. We have to understand what he's up to, how he fights, what his weapons are, what he's using. And, uh, and, and here the apostle Peter reminds us that we have a formidable foe in the devil. Please don't make any mistakes about it. The devil is alive and well. He's always seeking opportunity to destroy, to destroy the handiwork of God. And you and I are his main targets. I think sometimes we become complacent and we get into this posture that there is no devil somehow or the devil is not real, or I don't know what we're thinking. But the truth of the matter is that the devil is plenty real, that he is real, um, that he's fighting us, and that he is coming after us with everything that's within his power. He's trying to stop us, block us, kill us, destroy us. Um, the Bible said he comes, not, the enemy comes, or the thief comes, what? Not to kill, not, but to kill, still and destroy. And they're talking about Satan. Satan is coming to destroy us. Now, that's is not to frighten anybody because he thanked the Lord that we have protection. And we'll talk about the protection in a moment. But I think before we talk about our protections, we got to talk about how formidable and real our enemy is. Our enemy is real and he is coming after us. And some of us, uh, I think we take it too lightly as if it is not uh, um, real is not, you know, well, you know, we don't need to mention that. We, But you know what? You need to be cautious and you need to at all times know we got an enemy that 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 is, is taking the world. And the reason why Christ has empowered us is so that we can fight the good fight of faith, protecting those that are around us. Do you not know that you and I, those of us who are Christians, those of us who love the Lord, are the, this world's protection? Can you imagine when he takes us from this place, what's going to happen? What kind of carnage and what kind of evil and things will be done? Right now, the church of the living God is keeping this earth from going crazy, keeping the earth from being to uh, totally and utterly destroyed because we're here and we have the covering of Christ. We have his anointing. We have his power. We have his authority. But we also have the responsibility of 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 disseminating this gospel and getting as many people to Christ as is humanly possible during our lifetimes. And so this is, 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 is a very concerning to us because we, only, we still have the enemy to fight while we're fighting our own flesh and while we're fighting our own propensities and our own appetites and our own uh, 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 things that we are dealing with, we yet have an enemy that's fighting us as well. And so this is one of the reasons why the Bible tells us that we got to become more than conquerors. We can't just conquer uh, ourselves and think it's over. We gotta conquer ourselves, we gotta conquer the enemy, and we gotta conquer the things that are, are around us. But guess what? Greater is he that's in us ah, than he that is in the world. I'm so grateful for the word of God tonight. So I'm gonna uh, read from here uh, these various things. Jesus had plenty to say concerning the enemy. Sometimes you say, well, you know, we shouldn't mention it. But Jesus mentioned it so many times. He mentioned the enemy and he mentioned fighting the enemy. Let me tell you some of the things Jesus said. He called him uh, uh, the enemy. That was in Matthew 13. The evil one. That was Matthew 13 as well. The prince of this world. He called him that in John 12 and 31. 
he called him a liar and the father of lies. That's in John 8. A murderer in John 8. He, he said that he uh, saw him fall from heaven. Uh, this is Jesus saying that. He said that, 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 that Satan has a kingdom. And that was in Matthew 12 and 26. That evil men are his sons. That he sowed tares among the wheat. Uh, that he snatches the word from hearers. That all these are Matthew. Mark and Luke, he says, well, he bowed a woman for 18 years. He, he desires... He desired to have Peter and, and to sift him as wheat. Uh, that's in Luke. Uh, and, and, and what? That he has angels. This is the evil one, has angels. And that's in Matthew 25. And finally, it says the eternal fire is prepared for him. And that's Matthew 25 and 41. And so Jesus talked about the evil one on, on multiple occasions. He talked about it all the time. And so um, I want us to, we got to, if Jesus talked about him that much and he had that much to say about him, we need to at least keep our eye on this enemy, right? We need to know where he is, how he works, who he's coming after, and more importantly, how we can defeat him at all times. Um, so there are two, two aspects of, of spiritual warfare uh, I want to bring up today. Um, for us, if we're going to be victorious, we've got to do first what? Uh, we got to realize that we have a real enemy. That's the first one that we just said. Uh, a powerful, ageless deceptive, diabolical, demon of an imaginable strength and influence. And he hides in plain sight among us. And if we aren't careful, sometimes we unwittingly invite him right into our lives, into our homes, into our schools, into our communities, and even into our houses of worship. Sometimes, yes, we do. And, and, and the second thing we have to note is that how do we going to defeat this, this, this opponent? We gotta beat him. We have to win. Now, to defeat him, first we must again recognize he exists. Let's stop pretending that he doesn't exist. Let's not pretend that he's not influencing this world. He's not influencing our society. He's not influencing um, the decisions made by our governments, by uh, uh, um, our school systems. By and we see things, and we are sometimes so quiet. I read something today. That was so interesting. It wasn't necessarily spiritual, uh, or come, I shouldn't say it wasn't necessarily Christian, but it came from a person. But I thought it was important to note tonight. And it said that uh, when you have something to say, and I'm going to add, when God gives you something to say, right? Not to say it is a sin. When you have something to say and you don't say it, it's a sin. When God gives you something to say and you keep your mouth closed, that is a sin. I, I read that. I grappled with it for a while. Like, really? Is that true? And I came to the conclusion that has scriptural basis because whatever God asks us to do, whatever he, he requires of us, we have to do it even, even if it's begrudgingly, even if we don't want to do it, even if it's not what we would naturally do or naturally gravitate to. That's not the issue. The issue is if God has put it in your mouth to say, if you put it in your hands to do it, if he's put it on your mind to accomplish, it is your responsibility to do that. And sometimes we are so quiet about things that are going on in our society, in our world, uh, things that we know that are not of God. And, and someone's going to ask me now, well, how do you know it's not of God? Well, it's very simple, really, that Satan always wants to go against God. His whole essence is whatever God establishes, he wants to unestablish that. Whatever God starts, he wants to stop it. And so let's just use something as, as simple as creation. God created and he made human beings what? to procreate. right? He, and he has a plan for that. He had a procreation plan. right? And now the most common thing in our day and time what, is, is not to procreate, right? but we, we, we get together for, for recreation, but we don't get together for procreation. Consequently, now we are what, what I call anti-creation. Because if you're not pro-creation, then you're anti-creation. And so we are saying that uh, as, as a species, we're not concerned about procreating. We're concerned about recreation. I'm concerned about my own feelings, but I'm not dealing with what God intended for us to do. Are you, are you following how Satan comes and takes what God has put in order and destroys it and and, and and he makes it sound so wonderful and so good. And he makes it sound so just and so pure. 
And so, you know, what's wrong with this? And why can't we do it? And everything is me. Everything is, you know, about the individual. Christ, I love Christ. He said, listen, everything should be about oneness. We should be unified. It should be one church, one, one body, one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God above us all and in us all and working through us all. We are one family, one church. But in, 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 in Satan has come and, and said, no, 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 we're not one church. We're, we're thousands of different churches, hundreds of different denominations, and, 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 and each, each individual uh, should have what they want to have uh, irrespective of what everybody else has. It is the exact opposite of what Christ called for. And so as we are studying this word of God, I want to prepare us as we go into our new year. And as we go, uh, this is you know, leaving October, going into November, and the rest of the year, I want us to get ready for a study on Christology. Christology or the study of Christ. And I, you know, I've been dealing with this for the last couple of months in September to see exactly what we're talking about. And I think Christology is the closest. Um, it, it hit me uh, this week, I said, yes, we want to study the, the, the miracles of Christ, the parables of Christ, right? The prophecies concerning Christ. And we, we want to do a really in-depth study. But before we do that, we have to understand what the, 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 the working of Christ and the mind of Christ as it relates to us and how we must approach this text. And we can't approach it utilizing uh, satanic and demonic processes and thought patterns and constructs in our lives. We've got to be able to discern the Satan when we see him. We've got to know that this is not of God. This is demonic. This is not what he would have us to do. And when I say that, I know people get all spooky. Oh my goodness, when we say demonic and demons and all that. Listen, this is a spiritual fight. Uh, we're in a spiritual warfare. We're not in carnal warfare. And as a matter of fact, that brings you back to my notes. Uh, um, I'm, uh, here I have in my notes, to defeat him, to defeat Satan, we must recognize he exists. I said that. And please don't take him for granted or underestimate his power. Watch this. Additionally, we must understand the weapons that we have at our disposal. The Bible declares, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. And so we have uh, weapons. Right, that are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. That's why we can defeat Satan, even though he has powers, even though well, he's the prince of the power of the air, he's the god of this world, and all the things that Christ referred to him as. His, all these things are, 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 are totally true, but at the same token, well, he doesn't uh, supersede the power of Jesus. And aren't you glad to know? And when we have what well, been grafted into the family. We are now, beloved, now we the sons of God. And so the son of God had power to defeat Satan and now that we have become the children of God, we're the sons and daughters, the children of God, we now have that same power, that same authority, and yes, that same responsibility. Um, and so I just wanted to continue on, but I just wanted to give you that tidbit in my, that was in my heart while I was there before I forgot. Uh, 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 now, and watch this, and coupled with our strategic instruction from the Lord to resist the devil, right? and James said, well, and he will flee from you. So our strategic instruction from the Lord is, if you want to defeat him, what do we have to do? Resist him, not be quiet, not be passive, not run away, not ignore it, not turn our heads. All these things would get us destroyed. All these things will give Satan an upper hand, but we have to be strong enough what, to resist the devil and then he will flee from us. Why? Because he sees the Christ in us. Why? Because we have the authority, we have the covering of heaven up around us. We have a hedge of protection that he cannot pierce. Jesus already let us know what the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. So yes, the, the, you know, these, 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 um, these, these battles will come. The, the enemy will come, but they will not prevail. They will not destroy us. And so we're so grateful to know that we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Um, so I'll, I'll, let me let me continue on on my notes here, and, 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 and as my time is, is going away, um, so I'm, I'm going to continue to read. So while we argue over the correct form of government um, to have on this earth, please note that the kingdom of Christ. Now watch this. 
will not be democratic or socialist. And, and I'm sorry, I skipped over this part that said, let's, contend, let's consider his massive attack on the world society. So I'm talking about, uh, let's, let's, let's focus, let's see what Satan is actually doing. Let's see some of the stuff in action, because I've been talking about it theoretically. But let me give you a, a practical example of how Christ, excuse me, how Satan is, is trying to just mess up this world and try to destroy the world. And so I'll start over. It says, while we argue about the correct, quote unquote, correct form of government to have here on earth, please note that the kingdom of Christ will not be democratic or socialist. Right? You know, no, it won't be a democratic uh, uh, capitalist uh, society, and it won't be a socialist society. The kingdom of Christ will be theocratic. And I hope you, if you know what that means, that means we'll have a, a ruler, a king, a monarch. And that monarch will be none other than Jesus Christ, our Lord. There'll be one ruler caring for and loving all the people. Now, for those who are, or are Christians and pray every day, and, and we say, what? Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done. We're asking the Lord, basically, basically to abolish our current system of government and establish his. Did you realize that? That when we say, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, we're saying, forget about the United States of America. Forget about the European Union. Forget about Russia or saying, Lord, we want you to bring your kingdom and your kingdom along. And I know some of these uh, flag-waving uh, American citizens are mad with me, like, how dare you say that? But you must understand that Christ is not going to have a democratic society. And so we've got to, as the people of God, as the children of God, we've got to wear this, wear, the old folk used to say, well, wear this world like, like uh, loosely, like a loose garment. Because what, I, though I might be here, I'm in the world, all right, but I'm not of it. I, 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 my home is, in my, in my, my real estate is in heaven, all right, and I'm just running here. I'm not, this is not where my final place is. And, and basically, even Christ, when he comes with his kingdom here on earth, right, his kingdom, he will change the government and he will be the head of said government. Oh, my goodness. I know I'm getting in trouble. Uh, now, and so I'm going to keep reading. I better get on the back of my page. Uh, uh, now, so this request that thy kingdom come and will be done uh, is often in conflict with our actions, ideals, philosophies, and basic, basic psychology, right? For we have so long been inundated with the virtues of democratic capitalism and convinced of the evils of socialism or any other form of government for that matter. Uh, and, and so we think that we got it all together. And we hold that our view is sacred somehow. But let's look at the structure of what we're upholding to see if it fits the construct of kingdom values. So if, we, if what we have is so wonderful, it should stand under biblical scrutiny, shouldn't it? So when we have the Bible, it should stand and we shouldn't have a problem. Well, watch this, everybody. Um, so I think we'd all agree, I hope we all agree, that the substrata of the American economy, the, the, the foundation of the American economy, is supported in large measure by capitalism, right? We're a capitalist country. What does that mean? That means people are free to have businesses and all that and sell, and if they make money, they keep the money, in, and then they can keep as much money as they make, and it doesn't matter. So that's our, that's our country, right? But now watch this. We are a capitalist country, Right? And capitalist is dependent on consumerism to keep it going. In other words, a capitalist country can't keep going unless people are consuming stuff. So if I'm selling product, I have to have someone to sell it to. And the more I sell, the more I make. But when people stop buying, I don't make. And there, capitalism, you know, my whole, it, it, will, it will fold. Because it has to have consumers to keep going. And so it's been argued that I was just reading this, and, and, and I'm going to get more deep in it because it's very interesting. It has been argued that consumerism um, is a definition for that is the people living in a capitalist economy, right, engaging in a lifestyle of excessive materialism that revolves around reflective, reflexive, excuse me, wasteful or conspicuous overconsumption. How many of us know that that is? Honest God truth <laughs> that we are over consuming that uh, and especially uh, people of color we we laugh about it sometimes and we, but we know it's true that we are the world's greatest consumers and of course 
We're the first in consumption, the last in savings. You know all the stuff. We've heard it a hundred times. And it's very true. It goes to our psychic and it goes to our, our psychology and our and philosophy of life that we feel that we, uh, we, we deserve it. We must have it. Um, we want the best clothes. We want the best cars. We want the, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest houses. We want to be, you know, the biggest chains and everything. We want that because we feel we've been disenfranchised for so long and I'm making an excuse for it, but the truth of the matter is, I don't actually know why we do what we do, but I know that this is our MO and that we do that very often and do it very well. And so that is why you could never get rid of us in this country because we, we buy so much and we spend so much of our, our earnings that it keeps the country going. Now, let me ask you this though. Uh, now tell me, who does that sound like? Right, this overconsumption. This uh, reflective and wasteful uh, co and conspicuous overconsumption, materialism. Who does that sound like? Uh, certainly not Jesus, right? Jesus came what to give, to serve, to increase, to provide for and to nurture, right? But the enemy comes to what we said it before: kill, still, add and destroy. As Peter aptly put it. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I got this little part I read and then we'll, we'll close out. The spirit of consumerism has proven to be a destructive demonic oppression upon the people of God. It wars against the spirit of service, selflessness, and community. Think about it. Consumerism does not talk about service. The consumer says, serve me. I'm not serving you. I come to the restaurant. I'm not, I'm not coming there cleaning my own table. I'm not going there and, 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 and pick up any trays and serve myself. I'm not doing that. I come to be served. I come to, when I come to the store, I expect you to roll out the red carpet and serve me, serve me. Consumerism is about me. Now, Christ never, that was never his attitude. That was never his mode of operation. He did not do that. Christ came to serve. He came to be of service to others. And it is, it is see how Satan goes the exact opposite and then tells you that's what Jesus would have you to do. He would, wouldn't he have you to have the best? And he doesn't he want you to be rich? Doesn't he want you to be all the things? Well, the answer is no. That's not what he died for. The, so we're, sometimes we're afraid to just answer frankly and, and directly to something that's crazy. And that's the other thing, how you know it's a demonic spirit, because it's not logical. If it was logical, if Jesus had done that, then yes, if he didn't do it, how am I going to surmise that he wants me to do it? If none of the disciples did it, if none of the people following him uh, ever had that, then why would I assume that he wants me to do it? You see how illogical that is? It makes no sense at all. Of course not. It makes as much logic as a Satan telling, uh, the serpent telling Eve, that if she eats of this fruit of this tree, she'll be like God. Well, that makes no sense because if the tree can make you like God, then I want to know who made the tree because whoever made the tree has to be greater than God. But if God made the tree, there's no way that tree can make me greater than God because the, the, the tree is lesser than the maker of the tree. Are y'all following me? And, but Satan doesn't deal with logic. He deals with your emotion and gets you to say, that sounds good. And they looked at the fruit and said, the look, fruit look good. Let's eat it. And of course, we're here today as a result of that. But that illogical, that self-centered thinking is never Jesus. If you want to find Satan, just think it through. And you will see that any time you're thinking about yourself and yourself only, you're thinking about, I come to the church and I just want to hear the preach. I don't care about nobody else. I just want to do that is not Christ. He has something for you to do. If he's giving you his word, he said, my word will not return to me void. In other words, uh, it's going to accomplish what that I sent it. When he gives you word, he expects it to germinate and he expects it to grow. He expects to have a harvest based on the word that's in you. If you're getting word every week, if you're getting coming to Bible study every week, if you're hearing word and uh, from wherever you're hearing it from, it doesn't have to be me, it could be anybody you hear it from, it ought to be producing fruit. And it could only do that when, when we give in to what Christ gave it to us and not conform to the world system, what Satan's having, which is selfishness and self-unrighteousness uh, and all the things that he does to make us feel that we're, 
that we're holy, but in fact that we're really not at all, that we're doing the exact opposite of what God has us to do. Um, oh, so where am I? Consumer is all about the individual and their personal desires. The more um, that that destructive force takes hold of our society, the more that that destructive force takes hold of our society, our homes, country, lives, and even churches, uh, and we move further and further away from the spirit of truth and closer to the father of lies. Isn't it great, though, that we have the weaponry to defeat this demonic foe? Let's get dressed for battle. That's my notes. And I just want to read this scripture, and I'm done. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. I hope all of y'all got your Bibles out, because this is the one. And it says, finally, my brother. Some of us know this one, right? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness excuse me, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist Right? Uh, 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 with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Where am I? Uh, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, and above all, taking the shield of faith which, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I'm going to stop right there at the 19th verse. And this is the Apostle Paul um, just pleading with us and, and, and giving us, I'm going to take you off of mute right now. And, 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 all participants are unmuted. And just thank all of you for being a part of this Bible study. I hope you got something out of this, but let's not fall for the okie doke this evening to say, let's know that Satan is out there. He's trying to get us. He's trying to get you, he's trying to get me, and we're not going to let this happen. No, 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 we're not going to, not on our watch, right? We're not going to let it happen. We're not going to let Satan get us, but we know that what? The, the armor that we have, right? I love to put on the whole armor that we'll be able to stand. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We have the power we're going to have, and we already have the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. So with that said, we just want to thank everyone for being on uh, I want to just close out with a brief prayer. We never did come up on on um, Facebook, but that's okay. Uh, they'll put it up later, I hope. And um, and, and if not, y'all heard it. <laughs> and we got it here. And 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 and, and, and we, we we are on the same page. So let's just bow our heads as, in our closing prayer. Father, we thank you right now for these people, your people that have come. We pray, Lord, that you will just continue to help us to fight the good fight of faith. We're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. We're going to keep fighting. We're going to keep fighting and believing and trusting and getting stronger every day. Every time we come together in prayer in the morning, prayer in the evening, and we come on, on Wednesday nights and come on Sundays and we come together each and every day at our homes and we're, and we're praying always without ceasing. These are times that we're gaining strength, we're gaining power, we're gaining victory, we're gaining momentum. And Satan cannot stop us. And we come today believing and trusting in you and you alone. Your power is, oh God, is above every other power. Your will and your desire is above everything. And we thank you now for this time, for your people, and for this occasion. These things we pray in Jesus' name. God bless you tonight. And may heaven smile upon y'all. Y'all take care. See you next time. Thank you. God bless you. Hey, God bless you.